This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash yarazade. The first thing one learns about Vladimir Nobokov's wildly popular and acclaimed novel, Lolita, is that the narrator, one Humbert Humbert, is unreliable. One who's never read the novel and decides to read the summary on Wikipedia will be met with the description that Humbert Humbert is an unreliable narrator. If one were to watch resident Lolita expert Miss Lola's masterpiece video essay about Lolita, they would be met with Humbert Humbert being an unreliable narrator. Despite this, many readings of Lolita have painted Dolores Hayes, the 12-year-old girl, on the receiving end of a middle-aged man's obsession disguised as affection as the manipulator. Early critics of the novel interpreted Humbert as an innocent person, helpless to his own desires, and Dolores as the prey villain who instigates the mess that ensues. In really. his review of the novel, he went as far as to say, it is Lolita who ravishes Humbert. Esteemed literary and film critic Richard Schickel deemed Loris to be that most repugnant of all females, a mid-20th century pubescent American girl woman. Even on the internet, within the Tumblr and Wattpad subcultures that praise the nymphette aesthetic, Lolita and the aesthetic it's created is described as, a nymphette's personality is airy flirting acts as if she's innocent even though she knows she's not, and she has a lot of childlike energy. In some circles of critical thinking, Lolita is considered to be a femme fatale, the archetype popularized in film noir, a woman who used seduction as a vehicle to achieve their devious plans including murder, theft, etc. Nabokov chose to tell Lolita from the perspective of the villain. The writing of the novel was done so cleverly and beautifully with poetic language weaved throughout that many audiences, especially early audiences, forgot Humbert was the villain. Even though readers acknowledge Humbert as an unreliable narrator, it's not uncommon to find camps of people who see him as the victim, who believe his distorted perspective of reality, that Dolores was seducing him all along and acting like she had no idea. As such, they see Dolores as the girl who's pretending to be innocent when she isn't, as the girl who's manipulating the creep almost four times her age. In Lolita, solipsized or sodomized, Peter J. Rabinowitz penned an essay regarding this disconnect between Nabokov's intention with Lolita and the reader's interpretation of Lolita, deeming the disconnect to be, in part, due to the desire in high art circles to look into metaphor and disregard metonymy. He writes about how often Lolita is misread, by whom, and why this phenomenon occurs, plus what it means for the novel itself. This reading of Lolita, the one that sees Dolores as a corrupt Juliet and a scheming individual who actively manipulates an innocent man, didn't end with literary criticism published in the 1950s. It's been part of our culture for years. It's in songs that romanticize Lolita. It's in the popular Lolita fashion aesthetic, or the nymphette fashion aesthetic, where Dolores is described as a flirtatious little girl who is sexual and pretends to be innocent when she's not. These interpretations let Humbert off the hook as a hapless person who is weak to his urges toward young girls. In pop culture, this misreading presents itself in a couple of ways in different mediums, but the most common one is in films, specifically the semi-erotic thrillers featuring teenage girls as dangerous seductresses and manipulative masterminds. Let's not pretend teenagers aren't capable of committing some really heinous shit. We need look no further than the famous adolescent murder case Leopold and Loeb, and on screen, in fictional cases, there's nothing wrong with showing teens getting involved in crime or even being the masterminds behind crime. I actually love those kinds of movies, I have a whole list dedicated to it. But the erotic thriller where teenage girls are not only the masterminds of crime, but the seductresses who lure older men to their downfall are a little bit different. These movies existing is isn't a problem. Villainous, conniving teenage characters are fascinating and fun to watch. It's the framing of the villains and the protagonists in these films that raises a brow. It's the male gaze that lingers on them that sheds a different light to their significance. It would be one thing if these characters were planning a murder or to get rich through manipulation, exploitation, and the like, but it's another thing the way it's executed. 
Movies like Poison Ivy of 1992 and The Crush of 1993, just to name a couple, focus on the unhinged characters that are Ivy and Darian. I mean Adrian. Ivy and Adrian seduce older men, one successfully and one unsuccessfully, despite their young age. Ivy is 15, Adrian has just turned 14. And though the film should be equally suspicious of the older men who start sleeping with them, it's Ivy and Adrian who are the sole monsters of the story. They become hypersexualized sirens and the men surrounding them become sailors helpless but to succumb to their seduction. In doing so, the agency of the older men are stripped away and any culpability that they might have is washed clean or entirely exempt. In The Crush, Carrie was his character, Nick, makes a few passes at the 14-year-old Adrian. He suggests that he would be into her romantically and sexually if she was a bit older. He takes her on a ride to a romantic spot after dark. He welcomes the kiss that she initiates. It's only after the kiss that he seems to remember he's dealing with a child. A child he met, mind you, when she was playing around on roller skates in her neighborhood. At one point, he's hiding in her bedroom closet and watches her undress. An adult who understands Adrian is a kid or an adult who cares anything about consent, would have closed his eyes or, let's be honest, wouldn't have been in her bedroom in the first place. All the things he does that are questionable and cross the line, things that he chooses, end up being put off on Adrian. Adrian reveals herself too much and that's why he looked. Adrian flirted with him and that's why he flirted with her. Adrian kisses him so instead of dodging the kiss or cutting it off right away, he kisses her back. It's all her fault. There is an obvious flirtation on his part, which is entirely ignored because Adrian is just so crazy. Got my period. Poison Ivy stands out, as it's the only story from the perspective of another teenage girl, Sylvie. Sylvie meets Ivy by chance and takes a liking to her. She doesn't have very many friends and Ivy is kind of fascinating. But after meeting Sylvie's family, including her stepfather Daryl and her mother Georgie, Ivy gets a little too comfortable with them. She starts to wear Georgie's clothes, tries to seduce Daryl, wanting to replace the mom and fuck the dad. Daryl starts sleeping with a fucking kid. Ivy kills Georgie, tries to kill Sylvie to no avail. And and continues sleeping with Daryl. Now, of course, Ivy is villainous here. I mean, she kills an innocent person and gets away with it. But do you think anyone stops for a moment to question Daryl in this? The blame put on these girls in a movie universe where they are already put in the role of the antagonist or villain is a little frustrating, but what's more frustrating is how reminiscent it is of real life. Even though this depiction of all the blame for these sexual situations being put on the teenage girls is reminiscent of real life, it doesn't strike me as an attempt to criticize or bring awareness to the issue that is victim blaming. It's just a happenstance of a story where the girls are already villainous by nature. Again, there's nothing wrong with a teenage character being evil that stuff is great, but you have to wonder why these stories want to be so sexual in nature. Why are these movies fixated on putting these teenage girls, these teenage actresses, in situations where they are going to be hypersexualized? Both the directors of The Crush and Poison Ivy have said that these stories were based on things that happened to them in real life, a little bit dramatized for the sake of movie making. And in both films, the seduction is taken a little bit farther than I think it actually needs to go. There's a story about the production of the crush in that infamous closet scene. In the scene, Adrian becomes aware that Nick is hiding in the closet and she takes off her clothes. The camera cuts to her bare ass, which they used a body double for, and then Adrian turns around and no more nudity is shown. After seeing this, an executive called Alan Shapiro, the writer and director, and became quite hostile. He wasn't upset that the scene showed what looked to be a 16-year-old Alicia Silverstone's ass. Again, they used a body double. He was upset that the 16-year-old Alicia Silverstone wasn't completely naked. He wanted Shapiro to show her body completely nude, full frontal, and all. Shapiro refused, but isn't it a little weird that this movie was made and produced by people who clearly wanted to see a child be hypersexualized? Drew Barrymore was 16 at the time of filming Poison Ivy, where she made out with a near 60-year-old Tom Skerritt. Again, for the sex scenes, a body double was used, but the whole thing just makes me very uncomfortable. Here's a fun fact about The Crush. Alan Shapiro was allegedly inspired by a real incident that occurred when the teenage daughter of a family he was living with developed a crush on him. The crush became obsessive after he rejected the teenager and had the words cocksucker keyed into his car. What's interesting is not only how the drama in the film version escalates, but how Alan's counterpart, Nick, is initially receptive to the flirting. Shapiro makes the distinction that he, unlike Nick, shut down those advances right away, which he supposes is why his car was vanished 
finalized. But Nick, obviously, is a little infatuated with Adrian. He tells her if she was just a little older. He takes her on that late night drive. He kisses her. It makes me wonder if some of these movies are merely vehicles for the writers and or directors or producers to indulge in a fantasy. A fantasy where older men were able to lust after teen girls without being blamed for it. Where their fondling with kids is fine in comparison to the murder and attempted murder. These movies shift the entirety of the responsibility onto the shoulders of the adolescents. It's on them for being flirtatious to begin with. It's on them for showing too much skin or having an infatuation. And it renders these men who are all too eager to engage in sex with these teenagers as helpless victims who couldn't help themselves. It would be so much easier to turn off my mind and just see these movies as erotic thrillers, but there's so much subtext going on that it gets real uncomfortable real quick. I get the intrigue, the fascination to make something akin to an erotic thriller but a tamer version for teenagers. Fatal Attraction set in high school, but it's bewildering that this teenage version centers on a sexual relationship between an adult and a child. In Peter Schilling's Lolita review, he stated that it was Lolita that ravished Humbert and that Humbert calling himself a rapist was harsh, that Humbert was being too hard on himself. In the eyes of these early critics, Dolores, the victim of kidnapping and sexual abuse that went on for years, was the villain, and poor, unsuspecting Humbert was the victim. Dolores knew what she was doing, eating lollipops and chewing bubblegum and wearing those skirts and putting barrettes in her hair, you know, like a 12-year-old child might do. Misreading Lolita didn't start with Lolita, and it will not end with Lolita. It's just one of the many depressing results of the rape culture we live in, where victims are blamed and abusers couldn't help themselves where you ask someone what they did to be assaulted and not why the abuser assaulted in the first place. These movies are fictional, and devious teenagers in films are entertaining. But the way these movies let the adults around these teenage girls get away with what they get away with seems like nothing but a vehicle to indulge in a fantasy. And you have to wonder whether this short-lived trope has done more harm than good. Mubi is a curated streaming service, a place to watch beautiful, interesting, incredible cinema. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film from iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there is always something new to discover. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. When I was younger, I would spend days searching for obscure movies that ended up in my watch list. Sometimes I would find them, and other times I had to accept that finding those movies would be a lot harder than I expected. Movie reminds me of those days, because there have been many times that a film on my watch list that I had almost given up on looking for ended up on the platform. Most recently, I got to watch There Is No Evil from Mohamed Rasulif, which had been sitting in my watch list for months. It was amazing, by the way. Movie has granted me the chance to watch Ryusuke Hamaguchi's beautiful and entrancing Asako 1 and 2, which is easily one of the best films I have ever seen. All in all, I have found so many things on the platform that I haven't been able to watch elsewhere, and it's not only helped me with my watch list, but it's also introduced me to movies and directors I had no idea about in the first place, like Alexander Rockwell's Sweet Thing, a hopeful coming-of-age story that I highly, highly recommend and that has easily become one of my favorites of the year. If you're like me and you love 
love stumbling on cinema that's hard to find but easy to love, you'll love Mubi. And if you don't know where to start, I have compiled a new list of recommendations. I'll leave the link to that list in the description. You can try Mubi free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash Zade. That is M-U-B-I dot com slash Zade. For a whole month of great cinema for free.